USS Oriskany, 27,000-ton Essex-class aircraft carrier, awaits launching at the New York Navy Yard. She is the first United States capital ship completed since war's end. The giant ship slides down the ways to join the peacetime Navy. Named for a crucial battle in America's war for independence, she will help keep a hard-won peace. To San Francisco returns the battle-seasoned aircraft carrier Ticonderoga, 2,200 Pacific combat veterans aboard. In one of the worst kamikaze attacks of the war, the Ticonderoga lost 144 of her crew and suffered heavy damage. Home at last, she shows no scars. Navy men whom she brought back a real welcome. For the first time since he took office, President Truman receives the head of a fellow American government. Secretary Burns is present as Juan Antonio Rios, President of the Republic of Chile, is welcomed on the North Portico of the White House. <music> President Rios' visit is a tribute to the unity of the American nation. In British Columbia, Canada, the world's largest salmon fleet sets out on its annual job. A record catch awaits them this year, far ahead of last, helping to ease world food shortages. Nets one third of a mile long are dropped around a big school of salmon, and the hauling in begins. The season lasts only a few weeks, but it's good fishing indeed. Journey's end for the salmon, the cannery, where mass production methods complete the cleaning, cooking, and packing in less than 24 hours. Eighty percent of this catch will be sent abroad to help feed the hungry of the world. President Truman, on a tour of Tennessee Valley areas, relaxes for a moment with one of his young constituents, just before moving on to Gilbertsville, Kentucky, for the dedication of a great new dam, last of 16 erected by the Tennessee Valley Authority for the production of power and the rebuilding of this rich region. Mr. Truman calls for more such projects to lead the way to peacetime prosperity. The United States Naval Academy at Annapolis celebrates its 100th year. Opening Centennial Week, the midshipmen march to a memorial service honoring Annapolis men who have given their lives in the line of duty. ceremonies commemorate the founding of the Academy in 1845, and a unit of midshipmen wears the original 1845 uniform. In a gesture of comradeship, cadets of the West Point Military Academy present the steering wheel of the famed battleship Maine to their brothers of the Naval Service. Formal review climaxes the week of festivities. 
The uniforms of previous generations of midshipmen combine with those of the present day. The Naval Academy, founded a hundred years ago, has served its country well through both peace and war. Annapolis enters its second century as the officer's training ground of a Navy that is now the largest in world history. In bombed out Nuremberg, preparations go forward for the trials of Germany's major war criminals, and the shrine of Hitler's Nazism becomes its tomb. Nuremberg's court building, where the trials will be held, German prisoners work at enlarging and rebuilding the courtroom. Under American supervision, they install broadcasting booths and press facilities to carry the proceedings throughout the world. Robert H. Jackson, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, made preliminary arrangements for the trial. From the jail to the courtroom, a covered corridor has been erected. The war criminals will be screened from sight except in the courtroom, protected and saved for the disposition of United Nations justice. The big names of Hitler's Third Reich are kept under heavy guard. Twenty minutes daily, the prisoners walk out of doors. Constant vigilance prevents attempts at suicide or escape. Heavy nets guard against death leaps. The prisoners are kept in common cells. Goering. Von Ribbentrop. Tyson Quart. Dönitz. Von Poppen. Stryker. The leaders of Nazism face United Nations justice. <laughs>